thanks so much for coming on the show and giving us some of your time, even with the technical difficulties <laughs> we've been getting yeah. so far. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of how you, you know, Steve Ignorant prior to Crass, like where you grew up, you know, the early days, as it were. Uh, well, I grew up in a place called Dagnum. Um, I was born in a, uh, I was born in Stoke on Trent, uh, but when I was two, we moved down to Dagnum uh, to live with my grandparents. And basically, my early life uh, was spent in the suburbs where nothing particularly exciting happens, um, and you know, you just sort of muddle along day to day. Um, and, you know, I did what any sort of teenager does, really. Went to school um, when I was in my teens, started going down West Ham football, uh, got into that. And, uh, you know, later on, got started listening to a little bit of music. Um, and uh, when I was about, oh, when was it? When I was about uh, 17, I moved down to Bristol and went to see a punk band called The Clash which got me into punk rock and the rest, as they say, is history. So, you know, a very normal bog standard upbringing. Tell us a little bit about kind of like the social climate at the time. You know, what was it like growing up in that kind of period of uh, Dagnum, as it were? Well, you know, it's, it's very working class. And I, um, I mean, my grandparents had been through two world wars. Mm. Uh, I think I was born in 1957 and I think rationing went out maybe two or three years before that. So it was, you know... You ate what what you were given, um, and they didn't. You know, I always seemed to be hungry. And I think a lot of kids did as well. You know, they um, and it was a very Spartan existence. Yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't. Uh, you know, you were always on the lookout for sweets and things like that because there just wasn't the money around to buy it mm. uh, or to buy them. Um, and a pair of you know things like a pair of shoes would have to last you a year or two years. You know, and if if they wore out, then you you dad or your granddad fixed them with um, old tyres or whatever they could find you know so it was all really I suppose really like recycling and stuff but out of necessity um, and yeah it was a pretty you know I mean it wasn't you know I wasn't being beaten up and all that sort of stuff but it was a really it was quite hard you know yeah yeah definitely so when did you kind of you know excuse the uh, <laughs> generalisation but when did you kind of become kind of political as it were Oh, that didn't. Oh, that didn't come in. You know, till years. Like I don't think. You know, that politi- my political uh, realization came in really till I was in Crass. I mean, up until then. Um, you see, my my grandparents and and you know my mum were never into politics, um, so it was never really spoken about. Um, which is quite strange, really, because I uh, I know a lot of people like there's a guy called Tony Parsons who you know is reported by it now for the Daily Mirror. And uh, there's a guy called Brian Reed, you know, and and they've and a lot of people I've met from you know my era, if you like, or my generation, they all at a very early age were given a, some sort of education in socialist politics. Mm. Um, you know, their their dads, you know, joined the union, or or you know they were, you know, into the socialist workers' party or whatever. Um, I didn't have any of that in in my family, so. Um, part of the reason I called myself Steve Ignorant is because I was completely ignorant about politics. I mean, it just didn't touch me. Whenever I don't think my grandparents or parents ever voted. Um, I think if they had done, they probably would have voted Conservative, mm. uh, just because they liked the bloke's face, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or the colour of his tie. You know, it was that kind of it was that kind of naive. Um, so my I suppose my politics, if you like, came from things like watching um, kitchen sink dramas um, and reading books. Mm. Um, where for me the, the politics was really a sense of what's wrong and what's right and what's fair and what's not fair, yeah, if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. does. So I, mean, I assume you kind of got into punk rock, as it were, before you joined Crass. So I mean, uh, mm. how, what sort of bands were you listening to at the time? Well, there wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm living down in Bristol, I mean, it's, um, you know, those provincial towns, it, it you know, it seemed like at that time that, that um, you know, Sex Pistols and, and that weren't sort of venturing out too far beyond London. Mm. Um, and I think it's the same old story of like, you know, the st- London's the place to be, you know. Um, so the only band I'd ever heard of uh, was The Clash, and I went along to see them. I mean, Richard Hell was supporting, I think, with the Voidoids, but I don't, I really can't remember that at all. Um, and apart from that, I, don't me- I remember hearing about bands like um, Susie and the Banshees and, and The Slits, but I never got to saw them. Uh, and I didn't get to see them until about six months later when I was actually in London. Hmm. Um, you know, or living in Essex there at the Grass House. 
Um, so, you know, I think it's always, it, it was all, at the beginning, it was always the same, you know, that people, if you wanted to see punk rock, you actually had to travel up to London to see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because even though bands were sort of playing in pubs and clubs and things, punk rock was considered to be the devil's child. Mm. So, um, you know, a lot of punk bands would be refused, you know, um, to be, you know, wouldn't be allowed to play in pubs and clubs and things. And that's something you later on tried to kind of remedy with Crass, wasn't it? By you toured quite extensively. Well, yeah, because we felt that you know London wasn't the you know be all and end all, and and it was up to us to sort of set an example and go to places that, that bands. I mean, we played some ridiculous, not oh, so ridiculous, but you know, sort of looking back, you're like, why the hell did you go there? You know, places <laughs> like Winsford in Cheshire. You know, who's heard of that? Um, but we went, you know, and we used to have a great time up there um, when we started playing up in Cumbria, you know, and we'd be driving you know, over the hills and lake districts, and you'd see all these sort of punks and things with knapsacks on traipsing across the fields, you know, <laughs> to get to the gig. And we wouldn't be playing in big clubs and things. We'd be playing in, you know, scout halls and things like that. Um, and, yeah, that was really important for us, you know. And I think, really, you, you know, a, a, thankfully, a lot of bands took our example and started doing it as well, you know, um, playing in places that, are, you know, the the, the so-called known bands you know wouldn't wouldn't have touched with a barge pole yeah yeah and that's sort of something that's really kind of you know touched a lot of people's lives as well and it still continues to this day especially with stuff like the hardcore scene and all this kind of thing you see you know people making a real effort to try and get to these kind of uh more obscure kind of places that you know so people don't necessarily have to travel all the way down to london <laughs> well days. yeah well my take on the whole thing was like you know uh part of the reason we did our record so cheap we were because to my, you know, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. I was still on dole, I think, uh, which was about fourteen pounds a week. And um, you know, we're talking a, a, um, late seventies here. Um, and to me, it was like, well, you know, I'd like to buy a record, but I'd also like to be able to afford a packet of fags as well. Yeah, yeah. So my thinking was like, you know, no, let's do the gigs cheap because then, you know, they can get in and then they can still have a beer or they can still, you know, have a burger on the way home or something or still have buff fare. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was that kind of thing, really. Yeah, that's good. It's a kind of sense of sort of fairness, I suppose. Well, you, you know, I, I just always, you know, I mean, I still find myself, it's ridiculous sometimes, because I, I still find myself in this day and age, you know, right, I can either go to the pictures or I can have a pizza. <laughs> one of these. So oh. I'll go to the pub. So, <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Um, <laughs> and if I get like that, I'm sure other people do. So, you know, it's, it's an old working class thing, I suppose, you know, I don't know. How did you meet up with the other members of Crest and sort of form the band? What was the kind of story there? Well, I've been going to this place called Dial House, uh, which is where Crest started. Um, it's an old farmhouse in the middle of Essex, and I'd been introduced to that by my brother in 1973 or four, I can't remember. And um, it, to me, it was just a magical place. Um, you could go in any room you wanted to, apart from the private bedroom. And if you wanted to cook a meal, you could cook a meal. If you wanted to write poetry, you could write poetry or draw or, I, I don't know, do anything you wanted to do. Very creative place, you know. And for, mm. uh, you know, for a teenager from Dagenham, it was just amazing. And being spoken to like an equal, you know, like an adult. And um, and I kept going back and visiting over the years and over the years. And then when um, I decided I wanted to start a band with absolutely no idea of how to do that, <laughs> uh, I went over to visit um, Penny Rambo. Um, who had always lived at Dial House. And uh, I just said to him, I'm thinking of starting a band, you know, a punk band. He went, oh, I'll play drums for you. Literally, that's how it happened. <laughs> um, and at first, it was going to be, uh, you know, I said to him, what about guitars and things? And he went, oh, we don't need that. We'll, we'll be a drums and vocals outfit. Um, <laughs> because I think at that time, neither of us was really taking it seriously. We, you know, we thought we'd play to friends and when they came over on a Saturday night or something, mm. you know. Um, and then this guy called Steve Herman turned up, who was the first um, lead guitarist out of Crass. Uh, he happened to have a guitar, so he said he'd join in, that was all right. And then um, Andy Palmer turned up, who couldn't play anything. And uh, so he went and nicked a guitar and came back. Um, so he tuned that to an open chord, so he just had to strum it. Yeah. Um, and then Pete Wright, who and all these people have been visiting Dial House over the years, so we all sort of vaguely knew each other. And then Pete Wright, used to rehearse at Dial House every weekend with a little folk outfit he had going. And he got fed up with that, and uh, you know, I said, well, why don't you come in with us? And, and he did. And that, that was literally the start of the band. <laughs> um, it was all made up of people who'd been through it, you know, or, or had contact with Dial House. 
Mm. And the, the, um, from what I've read, there was quite a kind of contrast in the kind of social background of each member or of the group, mm. or at least some of the members. Did that kind of contribute, do you reckon, to the uh, the kind of, you know, the style of Crass? Yeah, because, it, I mean, for us, we were looking for a classless... I mean, to me, punk was, you know, it weren't the way you looked. Mm. It was more like an attitude, really. And uh, and to me, it didn't matter if, you know, you, you could have come from royalty, but as long as you had the right attitude, you know, you're still a punk in my eyes. So the fact that some people talk with a plummy accent or have been to a private school, like Andy Palmer, who had a really privileged upbringing, mm. uh, then you had me... But it made no difference to us because we was all in it together. We were just mates. You yeah, know? Yeah. And in fact, it was quite interesting talking to Andy about his boarding school um, because it sounded bloody horrible. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I never went. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the, uh, the English master inviting boys up for a brandy, you know, warming the brandy glass between his thighs. Creepy or what? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the funny thing is that people like reporters, you know, the press and stuff, try to say, oh, crass are just, you know, upper class or middle class wankers, don't know what they're on about, reckoning, you know, they're from the street. Well, that really sort of, you know, that used to make me laugh, you know, because Penny Rambo, for all of his, you know, and he came from a privileged background, um, but, you know, he worked on a coal round, you know, delivering coal for two years. You know, I'd like to have seen, I'd like to see Gary Bushell or any of those other reporters who reckon they were working class do that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, Andy Palmer ended up painting people's houses and stuff, you know. So it really made, it was just ridiculous, you know, that, that the fact that you might have a different accent um, meant that you were, you know, you weren't legible to be a punk. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. kind of goes against what the kind of ethos of punk was meant, you know, meant to be about, really. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean... Like the Bromley contingent, you know, who followed um, the Sex Pistols round, you know, well, they all came from art school, mm. and no one sort of had a pop at them about it, you know, because it was Sex Pistols, it was all right. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you agree with this, but uh, sort of around the time of Crass forming, punk did seem to be kind of becoming kind of commercialised at least. You know, you saw a lot of bands getting signed up to big labels, and yeah, there is on TV a lot. What what just made you kind of was that maybe one of the deciding factors in why you decided to make Crass sound the way it did and you know the kind of the, the act the way it did as it were. Uh, well, I think the, the reason Crass sounded like it did uh, sounded like it did was because none of us were musicians apart from Pete really who could you know play the bass guitar pretty good. Mm. Um, Penny Rambo has got roughly three different drum rhythms that he can play. That's military style, a bit of avant garde jazz, and a sort of sort of rolling jungle drum thing mm. um, so uh, we were pretty limited uh, and also the reason that, that Crass when we recorded had a particular sound was because we try always crammed so much onto the vinyl um, that the little grooves had to be so close together um, that's why it's so tinny because uh, you can't actually get the bass in there yeah, yeah. What I mean um, with this new technology and with remastering and being able to do it, you know, pump it up a bit. But again, you know, in, in those days, it was no value for money. Value for money, put out as much as you can. That's what it's all about. Um, and uh, and I think really that, that's where that comes, because we weren't musicians. We were we had something to say, and we would write the song, and then we'd build up the sound around it. Yeah. Uh, so really, if you, if you look at a song like, I don't know if you know Crass stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, well, for example, Mother Earth, you know, which is about uh, Myra Hindley. Yeah. Um, the lyrics were written first, and then if you actually listen to it now, it's like quite creepy, mm. um, and it's because it, we wanted to build an atmosphere, yeah, uh, yeah, rather than a tune around it. You guys described yourself pretty early on as a narco punk, didn't you? Rather than yeah. just uh, straight punk rock. What is what is um, what is a narco punk, and wh where does the kind of the idea sort of stem from? Well, when we when we started getting a, a following. We were being courted by um, the Socialist Workers' Party. They wanted to do, you know, they wanted us to do endless bloody gigs and benefits for them. Yeah. And we were going, no, we don't want to do that because we don't want to be seen as, as left, you know, as leftist. Um, and then, of course, uh, we would be also being courted by the right wing lot, you know, because of uh, boot boy music, you know, a few skinheads came and all that. Mm. And we were like, no, we don't want to be seen as righties either. How can we get out of it? Right, we'll call ourselves anarchists then, because because that's not political. You know, it's it's just against anything. Mm. Um, 
I think Penny Rambo tried to call us nihilists at one time, but I didn't. I was like, no, no, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> um, so really, it was just a way of of us showing that we weren't that we didn't belong. You know, we weren't left or right. We were just us. Um, but then, of course, we came up against that thing that you know you have to remember that anarchism hadn't really been heard of by young people in those days, mm. um, and certainly not by me. And the only image that was around of an anarchist was that old poster you used to get with the bearded hippie throwing a bomb yeah. or something like that. Um, so to show that we, that wasn't the sort of anarchism we were talking about, that's when we put up the CND symbol, you know, mm. and the peace symbol, to show that we weren't into throwing bombs around. Yeah. It all started getting really complicated, you know. <laughs> um, but basically that, that's what it was. Um, I mean, I never really, I think looking back, you know, I never saw myself as a, well, yes, I did. But my, you know, but then of course because we call ourselves anarchists, you get anarchists, so-called anarchists, coming to your gigs and talking to you about anarchism, which I had no clue what what it was. <laughs> um, and I'd be endlessly asked, "Have you read any anarchist literature?" No. Right. Um, well, what have, you know, how can you call yourself an anarchist then? Well, because I have this sense of, you know, I think to me anarchism is about respecting yourself and other people as human beings. And where my sense of anarchy comes from is again, uh, the angry young people writers from the 60s mm. people like Sheila Delaney Taste of Honey for example uh, and Alan Silito. Um so that's where my sense of anarchism comes from with the early shows I mean how did they go down because you did you guys did sound quite different to the kind of other punk bands of the time how how, how were you how were you received well at the, at the very beginning I mean we used to clear the halls you know um, people didn't get it at all uh, but I think that might have been because of, you know, bad PAs and we didn't have an idea that you had to have a sound engineer at the desk and stuff. Mm. Um, we just used to get on stage and crank it out. Um, but later on, I, I, after Feeding of the 5,000 came out um, and we started getting, you know, more people coming to gigs, we got our own sound engineer and stuff. Um, but I think people, because of the record, people have realised that it was totally different from what everyone else was doing. Mm. Um which I admit, I, I personally found a bit difficult, you know, because I wanted to go up there, and I'll admit it, I wanted to sound like the Sex Pistols or the Clash, yeah. you know, those great throbbing bass things, and we didn't have that. And what we had was something that used to scare us as well, doing <laughs> it, because no one else was doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was quite conf confrontational, and I think a lot of the... We used to get stuff thrown at us, like ashtrays and bottles and things, and I think that came from people actually being scared. Um, and you know when you're frightened, you'll sort of flash out. And yeah. yeah. Sort of and I think maybe that's where that came from. You know that we were really, you know, we used to stand at the front of the stage in black, you know, and stare in people's faces and sort of say, you know, like bring it on then. Um, and uh, we must have been fucking mad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talk about get yourself an easy ride. No. <laughs> um, so I, I think you know it's funny because I was talking to who was I talking to? I was talking to. Um, uh, Bob Butler, who plays bass for me at the moment, you know. Um, yeah. And he said the first time he heard Feeding of 5,000, it actually frightened him, you know, because it was so in your face and, you know. Um, and I think that actually what Crass did was sort of put a benchmark down then on punk rock, the rest of it, you know, it all sounds really tame now. I was yeah. listening to the Pistols the other night. It sounded so slow and so nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, a bit like speeding up rhythm and blues almost. Yeah, the, really strange. But I remember when I first heard Anarchy in the UK or God Save the Queen. My God, that was amazing. You know, sort of. So it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, no. I remember a friend of mine saying the first time he heard you guys. Um, I think he actually saw you guys live. He said it was like a well-needed shock to the system for punk itself, mm. kind of thing. And yeah, yeah, definitely. One thing that I've always been interested in is kind of as well as the look of Crass. I know that you mm. obviously you don't want. You said you wanted to kind of not have a look almost. <laughs> so you guys, yeah. so I mean, is that why you guys dressed up in kind of black and, you know, that kind of thing? Or? Well, the, the dressing up in black thing, actually, and this is true, um, came about. Penny Rambo always wore black. Mm. Um, I just used to wear anything. I used to nick other people's clothes and things. And uh, when we were all living together um, as crass, we used to do the weekly wash. And um, someone, I think it was Joy DeVive or something, put a pair of red socks or so, no she put she put something in the wash anyway it all came out a dirty grey all of the washing you know my favourite white t-shirt came out this sort of dirty grey colour yeah, yeah. and um, we so we just all wore it and that gradually evolved into the all wearing black thing later on it became well we'll all wear black because it you know we'll all wear the same thing because it, it you know 
it would be hard for people to define who is the front man and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because we wanted everyone to be equal within the within the band. And quite often I'd get, because we used very dim lights, we used to use um, four 40 watt light bulbs at the front of the stage, and that mm. was the lighting. Um, I quite often I'd get off stage and, and people wouldn't know that I'd just been on stage shouting at them. <laughs> um, so, so it worked. I mean, later on in years, of course, because I was, you know, hanging out in pubs and clubs and things, you know, people got to know who I was. Um, and, you know, even today now, I don't know. But at, at the time, it sort of worked like that, you know, that there was no, no one could be picked out as an individual, if you see what I mean. Must have looked quite menacing on stage as well, kind of, if you've got um, hardly well, any think- like. Yeah, from reports I've heard, I mean, it, it, some of the, you know, it did, you know, imagine that, we're all dressed in black with bloody armbands and stuff, with the crash symbol, which does look a bit sort of Union Jackie swastikery. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Um, and, it, you know, sometimes I think it must have looked like a bloody Nuremberg rally or something. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with all these horrible images being flashed at you from TVs and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the I mean, other it's thing. It's funny, because I, I, I never actually saw crash perform live. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> Um, that's the other thing I was going to ask you about actually is like you guys kind of also kind of sort of pioneered the use of kind of multimedia I suppose if you put that on stage and that was kind of uh, can you talk a bit about like kind of why you added that kind of component to the live uh, show well uh, no I think it was because uh, um, there was a guy called Mick Duffield who also lived and been in and out of Dial House over the years and he really liked what we were doing and offered to you know make a film uh, a collage film and show it our gigs. Um, so we said, yeah. Um, and then it was like, oh, well, um, we uh, the first video recorders uh, came out in those days, so we got one of those. And we used to film bits off of the TV um, and show that. So on one side of the stage, at the back of us, you'd have the screen showing all these images with mixed film. Then on, the, on one side of the stage, we'd have a TV monitor, which was showing what we recorded usually death and destruction off the news or something. Yeah. And on the other side of the stage, we'd have another TV monitor, which would be showing whatever programs were on that night. Um, then on top of that, you'd have us sort of screaming and shouting and carrying on. Um, so it was like this multi-visual thing coming at you. Um, but the idea of that was, well, even if you can't hear the lyrics because it's, they're being shouted too, too quickly or you know, the sound is rubbish, you might you know, remember a certain image and sort of remember the gigs or what you've been to in that way. Um, and it was, you know, it was just a sort of arty-farty way of trying it out, really. Um, and then other bands picked it up, and that was great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there, you seem to, there seems to be this kind of, um, kind of repetition of, like, crass influence in other bands as well, doesn't there? I mean, it, it, a lot of people seem to have kind of picked up the gauntlet that you guys threw down almost with crass. Is, mm. that, is that something that kind of you're quite proud of, I suppose, of? Yeah, I, I feel really honoured by that, um, and I think it's great. I think it's really good because I, I you know, I, I don't think anyone's come up with another crash yet. Um, but you know, people have been having a really good go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's great. I mean, I'd rather. All right, maybe I've seen it all before, you know, and and I, you know, I don't need to hear another song about nuclear war or death and destruction. But I'd rather have people being creative like that and having a go mm. than uh, having to suffer all this crap like Lady Gaga or, you know, the, all this X Factor rubbish, you know. Um, they call, hey, totally... like, the press are calling Lady Gaga punk, but that, that to me that seems like the most r- ridiculous well, statement. Well, that's, like... that's the press for you, isn't it? I mean, you know, she's about as punk as my backside, so... <laughs> Well, actually, my backside is quite punk. Yeah. But, um, I, can, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah. Lady Gaga, who, you know, what this contrived sort of sausage machine, uh, you know, record label production, and that's all she is. I mean, I've seen her do an interview, admittedly, with Jonathan Ross, who's mm-hmm. not the world's br- most brilliant interviewer. Um, and she just didn't have anything to say. You know, it was just like, all she does is wear funny clothes and sort of, well, anyway, each of their own. <laughs> yeah. As my auntie used to say, whatever lights your candle. Yeah, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the... Uh... Obviously, the, the Feeding of the 5,000, that was the first kind of crass album to come out, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you guys actually put it out yourself, didn't you? Yeah. And that, that's something that's quite important. For, you know, well, like... actually, the first, we did it through uh, Small Wonder Records. Oh, right, the okay. One. Um, it, was... And then what happened was that uh, because we had the track uh, on the original pressing, Christ Reality Asylum was actually on it. Mm. 
Um, but the, pr the pressing plant was in Ireland. And as you know, they're a very staunch Catholic country over there. Mm -hmm. And the plant workers heard it and refused to, to have anything to do with the record if that track was left on. Mm -hmm. So that's when we took it off and left the gap there, could sound of free speech. Um, and then when it was, so we, we released um, Reality Asylum as a separate single. And uh, some kid's mum complained about it to the police. Uh, they came round, the, the obscene publication squad come round to see us. And after that, it was, uh, um, we sort of thought it would be unfair of us because of the nature of what we're doing to jeopardise Pete, Pete Stennett, you know, the head of um, Small Wonder. Yeah, yeah. Because um, he used to run it all himself with his wife, you know, it's a very small concern. We thought it'd be unfair to sort of drop him in it or, you know, maybe get him in trouble mm. and lose his life. And plus, you know, we didn't think it, I certainly didn't think it was fair because of what we were doing to cause trouble for, for like Cockney Rejects. For example, we were an up-and-coming band at that time, and they were signed to Small Wonder. People like Patrick Fitzgerald, you know, it just didn't seem right. So we borrowed, we borrowed the money and pressed the next one ourselves, and that's how Crush Records started. Yeah, and that's something that, um, again, was kind of a, quite a big part of the kind of Crass story, I suppose, wasn't it? The kind of the DIY ethic, the uh, this yeah. idea, yeah, this idea of kind of doing everything yourself and not relying on, you know, a label and a, you know, kind of. Well, yeah, because that's what our so-called leaders, like the Clash and the Sex Pistols, are saying. You know, yeah, we should do it ourselves, and we don't need the the music industry and stuff. And we were like, yeah, you're right. You know, um, well, look who went and joined the music industry, and yeah. <laughs> look who didn't. You know, and and I mean, we, you know, as a label, we were like, right, we're only, we're only going to put out bands that we like, or you know, as people or as actual groups. And that's why we did such obscure stuff. You know, and what was really nice was that other labels started doing it. Um, and I remember, you know, in the early 80s, you know, if you looked down the charts and stuff, there was such a range of, of music that you could choose from, you know, bands and stuff. Um, like you had the Stiff label and you had, you know, um, us and you had, you know, someone else. Uh, and it was great, you know. Um, and, uh, and suddenly it all sort of went away. And I think part of that was that we had this um, import from America, which was called, I don't know, Grunge or something. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden, the whole movement took three steps backwards again, because people like listening to these idiots doing free called fresh, which had all been done before. <laughs> uh, so you know, there you go. And, and bands like you know, people like Reckless Eric suddenly didn't have anywhere to go. You know, because the whole circuit was taken over by this American influx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, one thing I always thought was really kind of a quite cool thing to do with the, running your own label was uh, you made the records really cheap didn't you like you said earlier on they were kind of like three quid or something or four quid or something quite cheap yeah yeah and that's well i mean you could, well we used to keep a recording cost down and um by doing it really quickly and uh we always printed on black and white yeah um did it, did it as cheaply as possible but still did it neatly mm. um and that's how we kept the cost down yeah, and again, uh, that's another thing you see done again these days, especially in the, the hardcore scene and stuff in the UK. You, see, you often see a lot of, uh, you know, the vinyl records will have kind of just photocopy covers, just you know, black and white kind of thing. That's definitely yeah. that's another yeah. thing that seems to have carried across kind of thing. It must be quite yeah. liberating as well, you know, because you guys were at Dial House at this point, weren't you? And you know, running your own label, and I think weren't you even like living off the land a bit as well? You kind of had your own gardens and stuff we well we had a we had a we had you know we had a big enough garden to have a vegetable plot so it made sense to sort of put vegetables in it and grow them you know and it, it, i mean it, we weren't self-sufficient but it did cut down on the food bills yeah yeah so. um and of course then we got moaned at for that as well mm, it's all right for you the garden well you know we're not saying to you go out and buy a place in the bloody country <laughs> or, and grow your own veg you know it's just what we do <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think the next, well, at least one of the next records you did, um, which you weren't actually on, which is the Penis Envy record. Yeah, that was quite yeah. a big deal at the time, wasn't it? For I mean, it was a kind of an feminist album, I suppose we called it. Yeah, first time it had been done as well. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so and I think that for people was a real eye opener. Um, and I mean, at first I was a bit miffed, you know, <laughs> bloody hell! I started the band and I'm not on it. <laughs> um, well, Steve, do you want to sing on a feminist record? Nope. Right, shut up, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I heard it, I was like, oh, this is actually this is really good, you know, when I read the, the lyrics and stuff. Um, and as I say, no one had done that before. I mean, you'd had a band like The Slits, but you couldn't really call them feminists, you know. And, and for the first time, I think there was a, 
there were songs out there about feminism, which wasn't just saying, um, I'll cut men's balls off or what how horrible men were and all that sort of stuff. And what's really nice is that um, even today, you know, being out on tour and um, performing um, a lot of the songs off of Penis Envy, a lot of women are coming up to Becky. Um, you know, the, the female vocalist I've got at the moment. Mm. And, you know, these they'll always come to the front when Becky's doing her bits. Um, and then they'll talk to Becky afterwards saying how Penis Envy really changed their lives. Yeah. Uh, which is really nice, you know. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's great. Really good. So, and plus, I, I thought it was such a such a naughty thing to do, you know. Sort of, first of all, you release a real boot boy album, like, you know, um, Feeding the 5,000. And next one, you put out Penis Envy, and all the blokes go, fucking hell, it's all birds singing. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, like, I really like the idea of that, of mucking around with them. <laughs> but why shouldn't you? It's punk, isn't it? Yeah. So what did you guys, what did you guys do, like, tour-wise? I've always kind of wanted to know this, because I guess if... Yeah, I guess you would go out on tour records once you'd release them kind of thing, but were you just not on the Penis Envy tour, or would you just go out and just do the songs from the previous records? Or Oh, uh, no, what, no, what we used to do, would, um, we'd, in, in the set, we'd have a mixture of all the songs, so um, uh, I would be on set. It's a bit like, you know, like why I'm performing today, you know, I'd do four songs, then Eve Libertine would come on and do a couple of songs, um, but I would just go to the side of the stage, um, and that had never been done before either, um, so that was a real spectacle. And of course, other bands picked that up, which was really nice. And and the lovely thing about um, Penis Envy uh, was that suddenly you had all these bands uh, and these blokes and women, you know, for the first time in their life, trying to write songs about um, not necessarily feminism, but like trying to write songs about sexism and and that kind of thing. Hmm. And some of them failed miserably, you know. But at least they had a go, you know. It was another sort of thinking point, really. Again, it's one of those records that you always hear quoted. I remember, like back in the nineties, there was a band called Huggy Bear, and they they always quoted Penis Envy as like one of their main kind of uh, influences. So it must be nice that this stuff still can. It's I mean, it still is. You, I know lots of people that you know still buy Crash records. It must be cool to see you know that it still has a kind of place, <laughs> as it were. Sort of oh, thing. it's amazing because like on my Facebook, you know, it's been a couple of people who saying, you know, I've um, I've just sort of bought my first Crash album. You know, I'm just loving it. You know, so yeah. it's really gratifying. Really yeah, lovely. Quite a special thing, I imagine. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now, one thing that happened yeah. during the Penis Envy uh, release that is I kind of find quite amusing, but also it's quite clever, was that you started the first of a series of kind of hoaxes, and the, um, I think this is one of my favourite ones was the uh, Creative Recording and Sound Service. <laughs> like... I know, I know, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that literally started as a joke around cups of tea at the table one night, and. Um... And it, it usually started like this, you know, oh, wouldn't it be a laugh if, you know, we did this and did that? Yeah, yeah. And I think what, there was this magazine called Loving, <laughs> and it was a real pappy, sort of rubbishy <laughs> paper, you know. And um, so, yeah, we, and we'd, uh, one of Penn's favourite songs used to be um, Lipstick on Your Collar, um, and we were joking with that, and, and Penn said, oh, you know, we should change it. And I said, what to? And he said, oh, lipstick round your penis. And I said, oh, well, let's, let's go one further and have a green ring round your penis. No, no, <laughs> that's too far. Anyway, so that um, lipstick on your collar actually became that loving flexi. Mm. Um, so, um, and then as you, you know, so that, uh, we phoned them up and said, look, we're, a, we're called Crescent, um, um, Creative Recording and Sound Services. And we'd like to donate this um, flexi disc to your, you know, for people on their wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> and they went for it, and um, and loads of people bought it and liked it. And actually, if you listen to it, there's nothing wrong in the lyrics at all. Mm. I mean, it's a very pappy bit, you know, set of lyrics, but there's nothing wrong in it. I'm, mean, you know, I mean, it's quite a nice thing to have on your wedding day if you're not getting married. <laughs> um, certainly, certainly nice to have an oh, it's a living blast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the minute it was like it's crass. Right, it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, and I think the magazine folded not long after that, actually. So, <laughs> Crass my walk, the yeah. downfall of Loving magazine. Yeah, perhaps you could try it with a bloody Daily Mail. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be a good idea. Mm. Definitely. Mm. So I think the next thing you did after that was Christ the Album, and that's kind of that was a, quite a turning point, because you kind of released it around the time of the Falklands War, didn't you? And, yeah. And uh, this is where a, a kind of... Um, 
a real change kind of could you talk, talk about what kind of happened to crash during that period because there, this is well what a... happened was that we'd done feeding we did penis envy then we'd done stages of the crash um and then we we um we were doing quite well you know and um so for christ the album we decided right um we'll do a double thing and we'll put it in a box and it'll be a special occasion what's it and we took it was the first time we took i think we took about six weeks to, to sort of record it you know there's all keyboards on it and it's all a bit of a better sound and stuff mm. really fan it around um i suppose that was our sort of rock star bit in the studio and all this yeah um and then but, but by during that the bloody falklands war started so by the time Christ came out, there wasn't one mention of the Falklands War on it. So then, very quickly, you went back in the studio and did uh, Yes Sir, I Will. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and bunged it out as quickly as possible. Before that, we did the Falklands Flexi, um, which was sheep farming in the Falklands. We produced that as a flexi disc, and uh, we gave that away free. Um, and didn't you get people in rough trade to kind of... Um you know, like, uh, sort of secretly put them into the sleeves of other records and stuff. We did that, but also the nice thing was that we um, we just used to, they, they used to be on piles, uh, there'd just be a stack of them in rough trade and stuff like that, and punks would, and it was for free, and punks would take handfuls, um, and they'd, they'd slip them in the daily, in, um, daily newspapers <laughs> at stations and things. So everyone got involved, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a good, uh, like, kind of community. Yeah, it was re- really good the way they did that, so. yeah. Definitely, and, and also around this time, that my favourite, I think, of all time, of like perhaps any kind of band hoax, was the Thatcher Gate tapes. Oh well. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about kind of people that don't know what they are, but because this was this caused quite a stir, didn't it? Um, could you? Yeah, well, it, again, it was like a, a tongue-in-cheek joke, um, and in those days, I mean, it was uh, it was cassette tapes. Mm. Um, there wasn't any, you know, people have to remember that. There were no mobile phones. There was no email. There was no computers, basically, in those days. Um, and uh, Thatcher and Reagan were sort of really cocking the world up. Mm. And uh, so we decided to sort of put our little spanner in the works. <laughs> um, so one person out of class, I won't mention his name, but it was a he, um, spent you know about two weeks uh, recording um, Thatcher and Reagan talking on TV. Mm. And then he um, painstakingly spliced you know physically cut um these these cassette tapes and stuck it all together so what he ended up with um after all these speeches you know different speeches um made by reagan and thatcher was what sounded like a conversation between the two of them very rough um where um margaret thatcher admits culpability for the falklands war you Mm. know and is prepared to start a nuclear war if you know, if need be, and that, that Britain is expendable within that. Uh, then the tape was sent to a friend in Amsterdam, who then sent it on to someone in Germany, who then sent it, leaked it uh, to uh, someone else. Mm. And the first we heard about it was about oh, it must have been about eight weeks after it had been sent off. And a little uh, column appeared in the Washington Post about a tape that had been discovered. And uh, then a couple more bits appeared in various papers. I can't remember what. And it was all this stuff about, you know, KGB sort of try to undermine the British and the American governments and all this. And we were like, bloody hell. <laughs> and then one day we got a phone call from this bloke, who, I think it was the Observer, and he goes, it's you, isn't it? And we went, what? And he went, this tape for him, it's you. And we went, no. And he went, look, I know it's you. And we was like, well, look, if you want to come over a cup of tea, you know, come and have a cup of tea. Anyway, he came over. We admitted it. Um, that hit the press. Um, and then the strange thing happened was that um, we had to do an interview with uh, Russian um, reporters and American reporters. Hmm. Um, well, the Russians were in one room, the Americans were in another one. So we were going from room to room, sort of doing these interviews. Well, the Russians, of course, had bought copious amounts of vodka with them, hmm. which we hit. <laughs> then we took through some vodka to the Americans. And they, the Americans were saying, well, ask the Russians if, you know, that, that, that. And then the, the Russian was saying, well, ask the Americans, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so we said, look, this is stupid. Why don't we all just sit in one room and get drunk? So that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the whole, but, I mean, the whole thing just went, cra- you know, to think that a crappy old cassette spliced together in the back room of a farmhouse in Essex was sort of seen to be a KGB threat <laughs> by the CIA. And which is when we all got, which is when all of Crass got files on on us. 
Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, MI5 as well, and our phone got tapped. So, Because uh, yeah, I've, I've seen it excited that you guys basically felt that you guys were kind of being harassed by the government at that point as well. Um, well... Well, we knew that they were, we, what we were doing was sort of very close to the edge, you know, and, and um, I think, you know, that one of the perks of the job, I suppose, is to, you know, get you know get your collar felt, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, Crass broke up in 1984, and to, to a lot of people, that always seemed like quite a kind of structured thing, because weren't the records, like, counting down or something, the label numbers? Yeah, well, that's, that's funny, because it, it's really strange, because I remember talking to Penn about that, and there was, there was never... Um, you know, although it was a countdown, um, it was just because of the book 1984. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember saying to Penn, look, what are we going to do when it's gone past 1984? You know, how are we going to do these record, you know, numbers? And uh, he said, I'll worry about it later. <laughs> um, coincidentally, though, um, Andy Palmer decided he wanted to leave the band in 1984. Um, and in, in sort of interviews, Penn has said, oh, it was always, uh, you know, we were going to stop in 1984. We weren't. I, you know, I don't remember that at all. No, we, we were going to carry on as long as possible. The strange thing is that by 1984, we were all burnt out. And when Andy said, oh, I'm going to leave the band now, I think me and someone else said, well, if it hadn't been you, Andy, it would have been me. Mm. You know, um, and I think everyone went, yeah, actually, he's right. You know, this is it now. We, we can't we can't do no more. Yeah. Um, we, we'd sort of really run out of it. Yeah, it seems like you kind of guys went out at a kind of peak as well which is uh you know kind of a good way to do to go and i think actually that might have also been why you know you're in some ways you're kind of fondly remembered as well you know i think a lot of bands they'll kind of flog it won't they and you know yeah. people just get sick of them but you guys went out kind of at a peak and that definitely yeah. seemed to be uh you know one of the reasons well yeah which brings us nicely around to why i'm doing this tour now and stuff, yeah so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no i agree with you there we always you know if there's one thing that we can all be proud of in press it's that we did stick to our guns you know and we did what we said we were going to do hmm. um and you're right we didn't flog it because i think you know in a funny way if we'd carried on trying to do it it would have become embarrassing yeah um I, or i think you know attendances would have dropped at gigs and stuff you know i, I don't think we could have said any more than what we had done yeah, yeah, job was done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. All right, so, and this is, before we go on to kind of like the book and the Last Supper and everything, um, could we perhaps talk a little bit about kind of this kind of grey area, at least as far as I'm concerned? It's like what happened sort of between now and when you left Crass kind of thing? So I know that you joined Conflict for a while as well. Mm. And then, is it true that you used to perform Punch and Judy shows? Yeah, yeah, I did that for about nine years. Brilliant. How, yeah. did, that, how did that come about? That's, that sounds really uh, fun. Well, when Crash finished, um, I was sort of sitting around, and I was like, oh, I'll write a solo album, you know, as you do, as one being a dimwit, that's the sort of thing you do, you know. Oh, mm. I would do a solo album. Um, and uh, thank God I saw this, this film called um, This Is Spinal Tap. Yeah. Uh, because originally I was going to do a solo album about Jack the Ripper. <laughs> 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 so I dropped that one like hot brick <laughs> and uh, God, imagine if I'd done it oh God anyway um, it's all CJT and all here uh, so uh, I thought well I still want to do a sort of I'd still want to do something you know um, and I was reading this old Victorian book I've got um, by a bloke called Henry Mayhew and what he used to do he would go and interview people in the street like uh, crossing sweepers or um Muffin men and all that sort of thing, and the thieves, and, yeah. and he, he he actually interviewed a Punch and Judy bloke, and uh, it was so uh, detailed, and he actually had the script in there, and uh, and it was also really political, and uh, and I, mean, I remember being frightened to death by Punch and Judy shows when I was a kid, and um, so I started researching it. And I actually started writing, I've still got the scripts upstairs somewhere, I, I was going to do a sort of radio play. Yeah. Um, if you can imagine an album like being a radio play sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I started writing that. Um, and to give myself a bit of inspiration, I actually carved a, a, a Mr. Punch figure out of wood and sort of had it on the shelf there. Mm. And then I thought, well, we get quite a lot of kids coming over, and I quite enjoyed carving out of wood. So I carved a whole set of Punch and Judy figures. And I thought, well, if the kids come over, I might as well do a little booth for them as well. So I made a little booth. And then I thought, well, I've done all this. I might as well try performing it. Um, so I did, and I was pretty good at it. And that's how that started. I got in touch with an um, entertainment agency. 
And uh, yeah, did it for about nine years. Um, the interesting thing was, though, that when I was actually researching the history of Punch, um, I quickly realised that he's a real anarchist figure, mm. which I hadn't realised before. And um, when you start really looking into it, you realise that he's an alcoholic, um, hunchbacked cripple, um, but always wins. Mm. Um, and he, in the, certainly in the Victorian times or the 1800s, he was seen as, as a real working class hero. And the original punch shows weren't designed for children. They were designed for adults. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, reading into it, I mean, for example, you know, there, was, there used to be, uh, in the 1800s or even up until 1900s, there used to be a blind beggar character in the show who would knock on the door, punch would open the door, and the blind man would knock on Punch's nose because obviously he didn't realise the door was open. Mm. Um, and Punch would say, what do you want? And the blind man would say, oh, um, I lost my sight in the sands of Egypt. Have you got any, you know, can I have a penny? And uh, it doesn't really mean anything until you realise that when the, the English forces were deployed against the, um, you know, the, the French in the Napoleonic Wars, there used to be a sand fly that used to lay its eggs in, your, in and around your eyes, which, which would cause temporary or, um, you know, um, permanent blindness. And anyone infected with that was sent back to England and left to be a beggar on the street. So that sort of, to me, put up a parallel with the Falklands War when there was going to be a victory parade, but the injured weren't allowed to take part because the sight of them might upset people. So yes. it all sort of, and suddenly it all slipped into place then. So, um, and I just loved the way that you could, you know, that Punch used to hit the copper and not get arrested. Well, he used to get arrested, but then he'd trick the hangman into his own noose. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the whole history of it, you know, I really, really got into it. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, yeah, I didn't, I've never looked at it in that way before, actually. That's quite interesting. I'll, I'll definitely keep that mm. in. That's a, Crass didn't kind of, well, for you at least, Crass kind of didn't completely go away. You you um, did a couple of shows in Shepherd's Bush, didn't you? Called, I think this yeah. Was, and um, there was always this kind of, I've, I've personally never understood it, but there was always a kind of controversy about these shows happening at least with some people not with like the i wouldn't even say the majority but with some people that you'd see it online and people yeah. complaining about it why do you think is it is is it because crass is so precious to people do you think that you know the idea of someone going and doing you know, these songs again i, I think yeah i think so I, I you know it was i had a lot of that oh steve you know you're going to blow the myth of of crass you know oh the, don't destroy the legend and all you know well sod it, you know, that's why Crass exists in the first place, was to destroy myths and legends, you know. Um, and it, it's very strange because people don't mind if someone like Jeffrey Lewis, for example, brings out an album of Crass songs mm. done in a sort of country and western style. Uh, that's okay. And no one minds if, if bands do Crass covers. But the minute the bloke who used to be the lead singer from Crass wants to perform those songs, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Um, and I, did, I was like, what bloody hell, I didn't want to, want to sing the songs that we did. God, you know, it's not like I'm sort of doing a Levi's advert or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, I think that um, everyone who came along to those shows uh, was so sort of knocked out by it um, that uh, this time around, you know, no, I think there's a few complaints, but, you know, I'll deal with that guilt with a second bottle of brandy I drink, you know, it really don't bother me. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, no, it, it, I think that's what it is, you know, that people have this sort of mythical idea of what crash should stand for. You know, that's the other weird thing, you know, that all my life, you know, I've been told what I can or can't do. Mm. And suddenly, you know, here are these people telling me what I should or shouldn't do about a band that I actually used to be in, and they weren't. Yeah, yeah. It's mad, isn't I had it, it the <laughs> other night in Amsterdam, some, you know, some kid, I went, how old are you, mate? He went, oh, I'm 32. And I went... And you're telling me what I should or shouldn't be doing as regards Crass songs. And he went, well, what Crass was about? And I went, so you were never in a band, and now you're going to tell me what Crass was about. <laughs> and that's the kind of weird stuff you get, you know, so you can't win. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> did the shows in London lead to, um, you know, the reactions you got from that and everything? Did that kind of lead to you then putting together... Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, although a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people came from, um, oh, God, America and France, Christ knows where, you know, um, and uh, after about a week after I'd done those Shepherds Bush gigs, um, and the phone didn't stop ringing, you know, come to Los Angeles, come to Berlin, do this, do that, and I was like, right, no. Um, so I took a couple of years off, um, because I, I figured, and I still won't do it again, 
Mm. You know, those two nights in Shepherd's Bush, we would have feeding a 5,000. They were a one-off. If, if anybody missed it, I'm sorry, but mm. I'm, they are never going to be repeated because they were unique. If I try to do that again, then it's going to be like flogging the dead horse. Yeah, yeah. But I did want to do something more, you know, because I realised that globally um, there are people who really want to see those crash songs performed mm. again. So I thought, OK, then, I'll do, I'll, what I'll do, I'll just do, you know, my favourites. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, and people are really appreciate, appreciating it, you know. I mean, they're really, I think people are really enjoying coming to almost the press gig, um, but coming to hear those songs and um, without the weight of, of the time of when they were written on our shoulders, it's almost like a celebration of it. Yeah, and yeah. people are smiling, you know, and, and sort of really enjoying it. And, and I think really the major thing what I've realised from doing this tour is that it gives people an opportunity to come up and shake you by the hand and just say thanks. Yeah. And that's all they want to do. Yeah, yeah. It's not a God worship or anything like that. It's just a real appreciation, you know, and I think people really appreciate that. You know, to have, stand there and have a couple of minutes chat with you and have a beer together, you know, or get a picture taken, I don't mind, you know, but it ain't God worship or anything. You mm. know, it's just people wanting to say thank you. Yeah, In the same that's... way that if I was to ever meet Barry Hines, who wrote Kez, I would do the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Now we sent our um, webmaster to go and the guy that does, designs our website for us to go and check check you guys out in Manchester, and he said that the atmosphere of the show was actually really, you know, kind of pleasant. It was a kind of, you know, everyone was just having fun. It was kind of a, a kind of like you said, like a kind of celebratory kind of atmosphere, kind of. Yeah, well, everyone, you know, a lot of the audience are as old as me now. That you know, they're all in their fifties and forties, you know. And Steve, I would stand have a beer with you, but I've got the baby sitting, you know, so it's that kind of thing. <laughs> But it's like really cute, you know. It's, no, it's just really nice, you know. That, and for us, you know, middle-aged people, you know, it's just nice to go to, to sort of look at each other and go, weren't those songs great? And it's like, yeah, you know. And God, didn't we have our time in the 80s? Yeah, but weren't it horrible? Yeah, but, you know, that kind of thing. Sort of, no, it's really nice. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, how long is the Last Supper going to last for? I mean, it's... it's... Well, I'm plan- I've, got, um, I've got to go to... Uh, we're going to Finland in a couple of weeks' time. We're doing two dates there, and then we have a couple of days off, and then we do um, Dublin, and then we do Belfast, and that's it for this year. All right, and then... So that's all Europe done, as much as we could do, or what offers we got. So next year, we look at, I think it's going to be in April, May, I think we're going to America, and then it's, there's talk about going to Australia and New Zealand. I'm not sure what's happened about that. Right. Um, and then next year, I'm hoping... By June or July, um, to to finish off, do the the very final gigs of the Last Supper at Shepherd's Bush Empire again. Excellent, and yeah. that'll be it. Yeah, I'll definitely come to that one, I think. Um, yeah, but the, the thing is, I've got to put a deadline on it, because I, you, you can't have this sort of Last Supper going on for 10 years, can you? It's, you know, <laughs> it's a long like supper. Like 69 or something, really <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> All right. So one last thing is like you've got you've got a book coming out. How did this come about? It's this it's something I I still haven't got my my hands on the copy of it yet. I'm meant to be getting, but right. when I do, I'm quite looking forward to reading it actually. After especially after this interview. So yeah, can you tell us right, a bit about right. how kind of the book came about and you know like how it's been received so far and everything? Um, well, it came about. I've been trying to write a sort of autobiography for about twenty years, but um, I always find it really hard to write about myself. And trying to write it myself, I kept getting bogged down and you know, on passages and then I'd get bored with doing it and sort of bung it in a drawer. So I just uh I got I met this guy called um Steve Pottinger, Spot he's known it. Um, met him and uh, he gave me a copy of a, a little book that he had done of his prose poetry. And it's the way that he writes is very sim- very similar to me. So I said to him, Would you be interested in helping me write my autobiography? So he went, Yeah, okay. The nice thing is that he didn't, you know, although he's heard of Crass, he didn't really, he didn't go to any gigs or anything. Yeah. Um, so he, he was able to do a really unbiased view of it. Yeah, that's good, yeah. I mean. um, and basically what he'd do, he would come over, interview me, ask me questions, which, and then he'd, he's, he's very good, Steve, because he would, he would say, well, what happened then? And I'd go off on this tangent and remember something I'd maybe forgotten. Mm. He'd go away, type it all up, uh, email it to me, I'd sort of check for it and change little bits and pieces. So together we actually, you know, wrote this book. Um, and what's nice about it is that um, it's a really, I think it's as honest and sincere as I could get it. You know, I haven't, um, because of Steve, you know, I've not been able to make myself bigger than what I've seen, you know. Mm. Um, 
you know, oh, I was a real football hooligan. No, I wasn't. I used to go to matches now and again and get the shit kicked out. Like, you know, so, um, and I used to, no, I didn't. I used to say that. Uh, so um, it's a very honest sort of thing. And I, because I wanted to show people that I'm just a human being, you know, and, um, you know, I'm just like anybody else with all mistakes and errors that, I'm, that I've made and still will still make. Um, and there's photographs in there of my family and, and me before I was a punk and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I touch on crass, um, but it's not all about crass. It's about my entire life from birth to now. Mm. Um, and the reviews of it have been really good. You know, people have been sort of writing to me and saying, oh, you know, it really reminds me of my childhood, you know, and, all my, and my school was just like your school, you know. Or I've even had a, um, a, um, an email from a bloke who went, used to go to the same school that I did. And uh, he said, yeah, I remember that teacher. He was a really sadistic bastard and he got the sack <laughs> <laughs> and all this kind of thing. So it's like really nice, you know. Oh, that's good to hear, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, before we let you go, um, what's your, do you have any like plans post The Last Supper? You know, what what what, what are you going to do next? What, after The Last Supper? Yeah. Oh, I'll take, I think I'll take a year off or something like that. Um, but what I'm going to do after that is like a spoken word thing. Um but it'll be with, um, I want to do it with um, a little stage set, you know, with like a few props. So that's a bit like watching the play, if you know what I mean, yeah, with lights yeah. and the visuals. Um, I'll, have a, I'll have a keyboard and a double bass and a little drum, so there's like background music. Um, and, uh, and I'll just talk about me, really, and sort of anecdotes and stuff. And then mm. what I'm sort of playing around that is maybe opening up to the audience so it's like a question and answer thing. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Because um, yeah. I think people have got a lot of questions they want to ask me. So, in a, in a sense, it could it might be like, you know, an audience with Steve Ingram, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that'd be cool, definitely. I like stuff um, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I've got to do, um, on Monday, I've got to go down to Rough Trade in Brick Lane in London there, and I've got to do a book signing thing, and that's going to be a question and answer forum thing so i'm looking forward to that yeah yeah definitely that'd be good i, I always really enjoy watching people like henry rollins from black flag and um mm. jello biafra do that kind of thing they're always kind of yeah it's always interesting stuff <laughs> yeah anyway steve thanks a lot mate i really appreciate you giving us quite a big chunk of your time actually sorry i've uh no, okay. no, that's all right mate <laughs>